And we're back today with another bunch of episodes of How the Fuck Did You Get That Job. Before we get started, got to give a big shout out to Open Fortune for making this possible. Open Fortune flipped the fortune cookie on its head by giving brands an opportunity to burn the brand of their brand into the consumer's minds, reaching 99% of zip codes, over 47,000 restaurants in a world where the average human sees about three to 5,000 in ads a day. Fortune cookies stand out, and it's just a fun way to uh, get involved and reach your consumer. So shout out Open Fortune for uh, making this possible. Sweet. Without further ado. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to How the Fuck Did You Get That Job, the space where we spotlight career trajectories that zigzag and skyrocket. After graduating from Temple University with a BA in journalism and an early stint at Condé Nast, Janal took a turn to banking at Advanta Bank Corp. She later ventured into strategy with Bond and eventually climbed the ladder at J. Walter Thompson Worldwide, reaching the role of Global Digital Director. Further refining her prowess, she attended the Marketing Academy's Executive Development Program. Now Janal holds a significant position as at Zipco as CMO and GM and is active on the board of Ideas United. So, Janelle, how the fuck did you get that job? <laughs> Good morning. Nice to Good meet morning. you. And it's great to be here. Yeah. Which job exactly? Yeah, let's go back. So I like starting, you know, you know, how how do you decide that Temple University and going to school in the States uh, was the right decision for you? Because that's, you know, a major decision to come over to uh, America and go to university. I, I think that I don't know if 18-year-old decisions are uh, you know, extremely profound. In my case, I was running away from math, to be honest. Uh, I think at that point in my, um, my, I'm a Bombay girl through and through, born and raised, and my options at that point were engineering or medicine. Um, I don't think I had seen enough other options for professional uh, opportunities at that point. And I was lucky enough to have a green card, and on a whim, I applied to colleges. Um, Temple University gave me full scholarship, and that was there the only go. way I could afford to come go to the else. U.S. Exactly, and and so I did. And um, I had, I have an incredibly supportive father, and all he said to me was, "Study whatever you want, as long as you'll be the best at it." There you go. Um, it's very empowering for an 18-year-old to hear that and to get that. Um, uh, support, validation, um, freedom yeah. um, from from my parents, and so I came here and I studied journalism. W was there a moment when you realized that it wasn't going to be engineering for you and it was going to be more of a creative out outlet? I think I always knew that. Um, I don't think I admitted that to myself. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I also think that I didn't give myself enough credit. I am extremely analytical. Um, but I think when growing up in an environment where that is the only skill that's valued, um, I think my creative side was fighting to get more airtime. So I think I grew up with a sense of, um, well, I'm not good at math, so I must do this. But that wasn't the truth, as I'm now realized. I yep. can run some pretty mean Excel sheets. <laughs> there you go. Um, but yeah, I, I, think, I think it was thirst for adventure, curiosity. Um, to see the world, and you know, you have an opportunity. You have to seize it. So yeah, I, I realized I that I realized that early too. Both my parents were doctors. Grandpa was a doctor, and I got to see in high school biology, and realized mm, like maybe not doctor is not the way for me. But again, you could still be analytical. You'd be, still be a great marketer. What did you learn from like going to school in Philly, uh, and what do you remember from your classes? that wanted you to like double down on you know journalism, but as well as more marketing? Uh, it's two things, actually. So, so let, me, let me reel back for a second. I, I, I think I mentioned this. I'm a Bombay girl through and through. Grew up in 400 square feet with, I think, at 10, 10 people in that much space at one point. Uh, I have 21st cousins, 42nd wow. cousins. So you can imagine the stories. You can imagine the everyday negotiation. I became very, very good at reading people and just genuinely interested in people around me and also became very good at influencing um, because you have to <laughs> to get your way in uh, sure. you know in 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 when there's so many voices opinions um, 
I think that is a golden thread that's continued. So even when I was at Tempo, it is predominantly, it was even back then, predominantly black. And when I was studying there, what was amazing is so many of my uh, classmates were often the first in their families to receive an education. Now that was a concept I was used to in India growing up. Uh, I, you know, I didn't imagine that I would meet so many classmates in the US who were, you know, in a similar sort of um, socioeconomic sure, sure background. It's, you just don't, you know, you always think of America very differently, you know, from when I was growing up. It was my from first the movies time and, yeah. Exactly. So what I learned, you know, during my time at Temple um, and what sort of has, has been that consistent thread again is Temple University, the students at one there had incredible grit, incredible grit, perseverance, and um, ambition. Like most of these uh, students were working full time and studying full time. And it was just, a, you know, to be in that environment was, uh, it, it hones you in a different way. Um, and I think the, the other part about the storytelling and the journalism, uh, I was in the School of Journalism and one of my professors, I still remember this amazing story, one of the exercises we had to do was go out on the street and interview the first person we find and write their life story. Oh, that's really cool. It was the, it, you know, certain moments, they, they stick with you. And this woman said something so profound. She said, she was talking about some family history and she said, you know, families come together when someone dies and when someone gets married. And, you know, she was, she was like, why, why would we wait for a sad occasion? Why can't we all get together in a happy occasion? And it was just so, you know, you're 20 years old and you're learning these profound truths from people's yeah. experiences. And I think that stayed with me. And marketing is very similar to that. It's, mm -hmm. you know, understanding people and their stories and the deep insights and, and the role a brand can play in understanding and honoring those insights about those people. Absolutely. Growing up, was there a... Uh, brand that kind of resonated with you. Yes, you might not heard, you might not have heard about it, but you ask any Indian immigrant about this brand, and it will bring a big smile on their face, and they will talk about this brand's advertising. It's called Amul Butter, and for ten years, when I walked to school, the first thing I would see was this big billboard. Um, it's a, it's a small dairy brand. They have this mascot, which is a little girl, and for. It's since 1966, actually, so way before I was born, they've been known for their incredible advertising, which is very tongue-in-cheek, pithy one-liners, reflections on politics, culture, commentary, on Bollywood, cricket. Um, so for 10 years, I've seen this billboard every you know second week refreshed with what's happening in culture. And I think what was really cool um, at that point is, you know, by commenting on culture, this brand became a cultural icon. Mm -hmm. And this tradition is still continuing. In fact, the copywriter who, Sylvester Dakuna, who was responsible for this brilliant, iconic campaign and brand, he just passed away recently. Uh -huh. But it's, um, you know, the tradition continues, this brand is iconic, and to think about a butter brand, um, it, it leave, it's left a lasting impression on every Indian. It's probably not just me. Absolutely, and how? I mean, that's that's so cool. I'm gonna have to do some research on Abs it. To, yes, to please check it out. do. Yes, and you know, this brand also pioneered, um, at least I think they did, the use of Hinglish, which is Hindi and mm -hmm. English, and it's uh, it was a very incredible reclaiming of um, our culture after in a post-colonial world. So that is, it's very layered. It's incredibly layered history to this brand. Fascinating, and they're still super successful now. Yeah, yeah, they're super successful, and uh, they're a huge part of the Indian diaspora internationally as well. You go to any Indian store, you're going to see Amul butter, and you're going to see Amul cheese. Might have to get somebody from there on the on the podcast. It's right around the yeah. corner, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell me about getting that first job out of college. Most of our listeners are, you know, younger, either in college or just graduating, and I feel like that's a question that. Is similar, like how the fuck did you get that job? But especially that first one, because you don't have too much on your resume other than some internships. Yeah, um, my first job actually was at InStyle magazine. So, and it came through uh, a guest professor who was in my, um, who was uh, uh, giving a lecture at my school, and she was an InStyle reporter and also a Temple alum. Uh, and I wrote to her, emailed her after that, asking for an internship. 
And she said, you know, Janelle, I've been coming to, you know, my alma mater for years. And every time I end the class and say, reach out to me, stay in touch. And no one does. And it was it was an aha moment. It's like, oh, I should be the person who will always be in touch, you know, with a guest speaker or uh, someone that I'm inspired by. And she helped me get my first internship. She opened the door for me at InStyle magazine. I came back to InStyle after my graduation and was lucky enough then to get a chance to work at Condé Nast and a bunch of other magazines. Uh, but my first real adult job was at Advanta, and that came through my blog. I'd been blogging before it was called blogging. I learned that the CEO of Advanta um, loved what he was reading on my blog, and I pitched him an idea. So how how did you know that he was reading? Because I was also reporting for um, PSFK and other. Was PSFK? How you, do you remember? Do you know about PSFK? So PSFK, this is in two thousand four, five, and they're still around. Yeah. They were the premier uh, trend and culture okay. uh, spotting blog and. Uh, there was an incredible community of freelancers like me who were uh, contributors on the blog. So PSFK was working with Advanta, and I think the CEO might have mentioned to um, the founder, uh, like, oh, you know, I read Janelle's blog, and she's, cool. she's pretty cool. I was 21 and cheeky, and, you know, I had an idea. I said, hey you need to have a credit card for young entrepreneurs. Uh, A lot of young people are, you know, they want to do their own thing. And Advanta was in the business of making, of, you know, I'm sure at that time there weren't too many too. No, credit cards for uh, small business owners. So I pitched him and he was a visionary and he said, well, come and do it. So here I am, a journalist inside a bank, trying to figure out how to launch a credit card for young entrepreneurs. There you go. And uh, what did that whole you know journey teach you? Well, it taught me that young people don't have great credit scores, yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't launch a credit card for them. But we did end up launching the very first social network that was ever launched by a brand, by a financial services brand. It was called Idea Blob. And very before, before its time. Before its time. And the whole premise was uh, anyone with an idea could submit it on this platform and uh, solicit votes, and every single month, the idea with the most number of votes, no question asked, would receive ten thousand dollars from Advanta to go see the idea through. And it, you know what was incredible about that time, you would see we would see people who, was, who were pitching the ideas, and then they were activating their networks on Facebook, on Twitter to drive votes. Mm-hmm. And I think that to me was something's happening. Something um, there's a momentous shift that's happening around us, and the way people are connecting and uh, leveraging the community. Um, I, I felt that I was on the, at the, on the fringes of something that was gonna change the world. Yeah, and I it mean, did. and it definitely did. When, you, when you're there and you have that journalism background, who are you learning from in order to like get those tangible skills or is it just fail, fail, succeed, fail, 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 succeed? It is a. It is definitely a bit of both. Uh, I do think, you know, as a journalist, and I, I think pretty much if you apply yourself in college, you do you do learn a lot of fundamental skills that are applicable in any environment. You know, for me, especially as a journalist, you do learn. You know, it, it's similar to a marketer in many ways, where you're trying to understand what is the crux of the story, who do you need to speak with, what are the facts that you're going to back up with. You know, to to build your story, um, what is the what is the golden thread, what is the unique, um, you know, heart of the story. And so, so I had a lot of that f- framework and structure of how to approach problem solving. And I applied that in the same space. It's like, okay, if I want to build this, what do I need to know about the customer, about the audience that we want to build this for? Um, and then that's the journey that I went on. Now, obviously, there was a whole world, a subject matter expertise that I did not have, which was in financial services and credit and how that world works. And that's why I relied upon the experts there and the mentors and build those relationships inside the organization um, to to help you know help me you know fill that picture out. It was also an amazing experience in learning that when you're trying to build something from scratch that doesn't exist, so much of that work is influencing, getting everybody else aligned to that idea, excited for that idea, because you are never going to be able to do it alone. How, how do you go about influencing <clears throat> others uh, and key stakeholders? Uh, you do it 
uh, objectively and then with passion. So what I mean by that is um, I had a business case that I created. I'm not saying it was the best business case out there, but that, you know, here's why this is a good idea. Here's why we should uh, explore this. Here are the numbers. Here's how much, you know, young entrepreneurs are spending. Here's sort of how many young entrepreneurs are launching their own business each year. Um, here are what their needs are. So, you know, I did my best that I could in building a business case. I and mean, very objectively, uh, as much data, as many facts as I could, and then passion, because you got to sell it. You have to sell it. You yeah. have to sell it. And the je ne sais quoi, it's the, it's the, um, you know, the why me? Like, why should I listen to Janelle? Like, what is it about her? And that's when I leveraged my experience as, look, I've been blogging before it was called blogging. Yeah. And that's what's opened doors for me. I was a freelance reporter, which was like learning my own business. And um, I was an independent, you know, um, contractor or journalist yeah, and you made and the product for yourself in a way exactly so you know a bit of so objectivity and then passion and uh, i will not lie the championship of my ceo absolutely helped sure. um and i don't think that recipe has changed very much and now that i mean i'm a cmo <laughs> yeah i i love and it's a common theme behind a lot of episodes that i've recorded is the answer to how the fuck did you get that job is almost I created it, right? Like yeah. you you pitched yes. him, right? It wasn't necessarily like a LinkedIn DM or whatever it may be, right? You kind of just manifested yourself and I think that's awesome. Uh, I wanna talk about the, you know, your agency background as well. Uh, what, you know, what was expectation versus reality when stepping into the ad agency world? What I'll say about my ad agency days, I spent about a decade there, and majority of them at J. Walter Thompson, my alma mater, and um, my, my formative years were shaped there. Um, my agency experience, that decade, is where I learned the craft, where I truly learned the craft of advertising, and I learned the art of marketing. Um, I learned you know, that you know, it's always, always, always about the work and you're only as good as the work that you're actually producing and launching. Um, you develop an incredible, se a very strong sense of um, um, conviction, and you have to have a point of view. My, my early boss in the advertising days would always tell me, Janelle, if you're in a room, I'm expecting you to have a point of view, and I'm 24, I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I don't point of view about what, you know, so, but it, it forced me to be well-read and forced me to process and think and make the connections and make sure that if I was in a room, I had to have a point of view. I had to uh, justify my reason for being in the room. And I think advertising and that decade in that room, does the decade in that industry gives you very good conditioning for that. It teaches you to trust your own voice. It teaches you to trust your own uh, intuition. Um, and then you know the collaborative. You you there's nothing you can launch alone or do alone. You need variety of perspectives to bring an idea to life, to hone it, to refine it, including your client's perspective and including the client's feedback. So I think there are a lot of these fundamental uh, values that still guide me and that still have uh, you know how I show up as a professional, as I show up as a CMO, that have come from my agency background. Absolutely. I I want to ask you about maybe two ad campaigns that you worked on when you were there. One that you expected to go extremely, extremely well and may have not, and the opposite, one that you didn't have low expectations for and absolutely over-delivered. Um, I think that... You know, the one that sticks out in my mind right now is... Um, I wouldn't even call it ad campaign. Uh, I was I joined a fledgling department at J. Walter Thompson at that point called the Experience Group. And we were a group of misfits. We had, there were game designers, there were folks like me who had, um, you know, I'd launched a social network, I had launched um, American Express's uh, openforum.com, so not a traditional advertising sure. person. Uh, so this Experience Group, we were 
we were respons- we were builders and I thrive in those environments where I'm building something and creating something or uh, convincing someone to do something that's never been done before. So I was part of the team that convinced Macy's to launch Wi-Fi across all their stores oh, wow. and launch uh, QR codes. Um, what year was this? This was, I want to say, 2010, 11. Um, and we call, the, the program was called Backstage Pass, and uh, it was uh, the first time that any ma- massive department store had blended in culture and commerce. And so we worked with all the Macy's celebrities that have brands there to create short content Very that cool. could be unlocked using QR, um, yeah, QR, QR codes. codes. That was like the first time QR codes. Exactly. So, early days of QR codes. You know, I, I think in hindsight, the win there was building this new muscle, both for J. Walter Thompson, but also for a retailer. The loss there was, of course, QR codes um, haven't been, hadn't been mainstream back then. There were still challenges with the flickering Wi-Fi, so they weren't sure. easily accessible. Video quality, you know, when you did unlock that, wasn't amazing. Um, but it was important to take that risk and show the retailer and you know build that muscle both inside there and inside J. Walter Thompson um, with with you know pushing forward. And I think I, so. I wouldn't call it a campaign. Sure. I think the work that I've done has always pushed the boundaries in terms of marketing with building new muscle, I think. That's, um, and, and, um, and then, dr- you know, obviously leading to impact, uh, but impact doesn't necessarily mean immediately or over, t- you know, yeah. sometimes over time. Absolutely, yeah, you have to be patient to see, to see the success exactly. of Exactly, and the wildly things. successful one that I'll tell you about was also with Macy's, and that was actually a couple of years later where Macy's had this uh, franchise called Yes, Virginia, which is this classic American um, uh, Christmas story about a little girl who um, uh, wrote, uh, was told that Santa Claus doesn't exist, and she wrote to the editor of the New York Sun, and um, he responded saying, yes, Virginia, Santa Claus is real. And we took that, and we worked with Macy's to make that into a Broadway play, and we distributed it to schools for free. So cool. Um, it was incredible. We had all, um, all of, again, Macy's, all these celebrities that worked with Macy's, create short videos to encourage students and teachers and train them on the song and the music, and that was extremely successful because this was during a time when arts funding was being cut in public schools. Um, our teachers were losing funding as well. And um, you know, distributing this for free um, did wonders. So a lot of schools actually staged the play and it actually went on and won an award, uh, won uh, the Gold Lion. And, that, that's amazing. Yeah, that's so, so cool. I'm gonna have to check that out after this. Yeah. Uh, so I know from what it seems, at least, and how you talk about J. Walter Thompson, it has a special place in your heart. You literally grabbed your chest and yeah. uh, like, sounds like you had an amazing time. What made you want to go brand side? Yeah, I, I did have an amazing time. And I know J. Walter Thompson as a brand doesn't exist anymore, but it is, um, um, I owe a lot of who I am to my six to my years there. Um, what made me want to leave advertising? I came. I I had joined ad- advertising agencies not because I wanted to work at an agency, but because at that point, a lot of innovative thinking and work was happening inside agencies, so outside of organizations. I decided to leave when the shift happened where I felt that a lot of innovative work was now happening inside organizations. So Why do you think that shift was happening? I think the shift happened as uh, you know as so it started with social then it moved into digital technology and I think as uh, this new skill set developed as there were more people practicing this craft um, you know, they were building a lot more momentum inside organizations. And um, I think organizations were building these uh, capabilities and the muscle memory. So I, I think Just it's to quite- do it in-house. Yeah. yeah, and I think it is it is natural progression if you think about it. It is um, not unusual. I mean, now we are in a day and age where a lot of companies have in-house studios um, and they build their own creative and, um, you know, they do that all in-house now. And that is uh, largely a result of um, you know, ex-agency people have gone on and taken these skill sets and um, helped evolve, you know, what organizations can be. So I was at that point as well, and I felt honestly that I'd learned everything I could on the agency side at that point. And um, I um, 
wanted also my next decade of my career to be about leadership. I'd learned my craft and while the work on honing your craft never stops, I did want to learn how to be a leader and how to develop commercial acumen because that is, you don't learn those things on the advertising side. Um, so I was fortunate to, do, again, join um, an incredible company, Newell Brands, and again, in a builder role. So I joined them when uh, e-commerce, especially brands uh, coming on Amazon and Walmart and having their own direct-to-consumer was at that uh, threshold. And I joined uh, Newell Brands to help build their e-commerce marketing machine in-house. So within three months, I built a team of 80 people and we were, building content, doing advertising, and responsible for about driving $2 billion in e-com revenue across 50 brands. That's unbelievable. What do you think the biggest difference was from working brand side versus an agency? It's accountability, uh, absolutely accountability, and uh, a commercial sense. So those were things I had to learn. I I hired a coach to teach me. Um, I was like, I'm making this shift, and uh, there is um, the known knowns, there is the known unknowns, and there's the unknown unknown. And I absolutely was going to go unprepared. So I had, um, I had, a, you know, I hired out of my own dime a bunch of coaches to like, okay, what do I need to know about this world? Um, you know, you'd, I'd done performance marketing and all, but very much from a brand perspective and, um, you know, or from the agency perspective. And it's very different when you work inside a brand. Your the way you look at data. Um, the way you make decisions based on data, the access that you have to other data. Um, so it's a, it's a different muscle, it's a different skill set, and I had my training wheels on. So And, and then you end up transitioning to Swell, <laughs> which at the time, and still is, one of like the hottest companies. Uh, what were the pain points that they brought you in to, to solve? Yes, um, I'll, I'll talk about both Swell and Feather. You know, so Newell Brands was incredible, but I was still in this phase where I was working for large brands and I was struggling. I had I was going through an existential crisis in, in that I was like, am I a good marketer? Because I've always worked with brands, you know, at J. Walter Thompson and even at Newell Brands where massive budgets, my budget at Newell Brands was $80 million and that was just on the e-commerce side alone. And I was beginning to question you know, what is my contribution? Like, what have I done here other than build this amazing team and build this machine? Like, but what is, what is, what can I point to and say that, hey, Janal did this and this is what, you know, drove the business. So at that point, I knew I wanted to go to a more entrepreneurial environment and see what I was made of. Um, you know, really, was the builder in me just successful in these large environments where I had the resources, the champion, the support, or could I actually be successful in smaller environments? Um, so that's where Swell and Feather came in, and I worked with a lot of the same group of people at both companies. Um, you know, Swell, our, re- our head of merchandising, took me with her at Feather. Um, but both these brands have a couple of things in common. I think that both of them were these you know, ideologies that they were building in the world. You know, Swell's mission still remains reading the world of single-use plastic. And with Feather, the ideology around that was similar, which is um, how do you get, you know, how do you build a world which is around reusing and um, and and um, recycling furniture. So I think for me, the challenge there that attracted me both to both these roles was, can I scale an ideology? Can I, because it's, it's more than just about the product. Um, sure. um, You've proven it to yourself. Too. Proving it to myself, and, and I, I, I think I did. Um, <laughs> you know, what we, was the moment you realized you, you could do it? There were two moments. One, obviously, n- you know, seeing the numbers itself, uh, sure. seeing the effort show up in the results, uh, quarter over quarter. Uh, and then I think there was the external validation. Uh, my work uh, got me, uh, you know, with Feather, I got on at age 40 under 40, and it was nice to get recognition for the brand and the business when, you know, Fast Company uh, recognized us as the most design-led company. Inc. recognized us as um, the fastest growing startup. We had an exit. So I think that it, it nothing built my confidence, like actually like getting my sure. hands dirty, sometimes even writing the copy myself, yeah. which God, I never want to do that. I'm not good at that, but, um, it was an important test for me to see what I was made of. 
yeah, I mean, it's it's super cool when you go from a bigger company and go in the dirt and you're like, hey, let's, again, like you're saying, see what you're made of. Do you prefer working, you know, what's your ideal uh, company size to be running marketing at? I think that um, I don't, I think that I have a different framework of how I'm looking at what is ideal for me. Um, one is, like I mentioned, what is the ideology? What is the big idea that I am serving and who is the customer that I'm serving? Um, I think that is always number one for me. The second piece is around, um, you know, what is the, uh, what is my contribution going to be here? Both in terms, like I, I think you could join brands where your impact is in maintaining, so where everything is really well defined and you're sort of building. You're just already the leader in the club. Yes, you're yeah. leading and you're building on, and and the and the iconic brands are that, right? You get to do amazing iconic work, and you're working well within the confines of what exists. And I think then there is work around early stage brands, which is you know you're still building a brand. I, I think where I am right now with Zip, we're a ten year old brand and. I have to remind myself on where can I be precious about this and where I shouldn't be precious about this. So I think there is a bit of that different mindset. So I think for me, the way I can distill that is this entrepreneurial mindset versus a more sort of uh, steady state iconic brand mindset. And the last few years of my career, I've been attracted more to environments where it's been more of that entrepreneurial mindset. I think that Again, it speaks to this thread in me. I thrive when I'm building something, when I'm creating something, birthing something that doesn't exist. And um, I also have had the fortune of working with uh, in founder-driven environments. And what I found, what I find to be the case in founder-led environments at Swell, at Feather, at Zip, um, that is a that is a spirit that is um, infectious. That is a culture code. That is. Um, that is a personality that is very, very hard to replicate and very, very hard to, uh, you know, it, it, that's not what exists in large organization. And for the last few years, I've, I've thrived on learning from founders and helping bring their vision to life. Yeah, no, I can, I can definitely see that. Even myself, I've only worked for founder-led companies to date, and there is something kind of infectious, especially if you buy into the mission of it. So I'd recommend that too to younger listeners. Um, if they you want to get there, you learn to take risks yeah. very differently. And you know, uh, even now, my founder, Larry Diamond, um, he, he, uh, you know, we are a, we are a publicly listed company. We had a, you know, proper business, but. One of the core, you know, brand, um, you know, values or you know, internal employee values is customer first, and he is the first person to always like talk about and how is this benefiting our customer, mm -hmm. and have you spoken to customers? So it's you know, it, it just it's it's it it hones you differently. It gives you a different conviction. It it puts you in a very different headspace when you're so invested in the mission and the the the, um, the pain also and the struggle. It's not just of, a job. It's not just a yeah. job. And I no. think that's, that's the biggest takeaway that I, at least I've gotten yes. out of it. And I can hear it from you uh, and the way you speak about it. Why, is, why was Zip the right move for you? Other, obviously, you've touched on the founder stuff, but those companies you were working before were, you know, startup-y and founder-led. Yeah, uh, there were three reasons for this. Um, one, obviously, founder-led that was absolutely attractive, and to be in a founder-led environment in a publicly listed as a public company, uh, mm. I thought that would be amazing. What what comes with being, uh, you know? Public. Pu public, yeah. Um, you know, I think it was one graduation of my own professional ambition. I think that I was ready to um, to to learn what it takes to scale companies at a very different scale. And I, had, you know, again, I wouldn't say that working at agencies or Newell, um, I had scaled companies. I think it's you know, you when you work in large organization, the growth in bips um, and share, you know, your your um, your. Um, uh, Voice of sh like your share ownership, uh, share of voice ownership, and I was uh, I was interested in what it would be like to work inside a, a you know public organization, but that is still on this growth trajectory. So I think um, 
I, I think for me that sort of was the right move at that point. But the other piece and the bigger reason why is, as I mentioned before, my career has been at the intersection of culture and commerce for a very long time. And, um, you know, what I liked about Zip was the payments angle to it. I genuinely think payments is the next frontier. And I'll tell you two reasons why. When I was at Feather, this was in the midst of COVID. And we were, you know, Feather was like run the runway, but for furniture. And what I started to see happen is, um, you know, buy now, pay later at that point was going through an enormous surge in um, popularity and becoming mainstream. And why do you think so? It, one, I think that well, with COVID, a lot of um, digital behaviors became mainstream. I think sure. I think you know we just accelerated a lot of digital behaviors. I think around that time. Um, there is accessibility and access to capital and access to credit that buy not pay later, um, you know, as a category made possible. That it was just different. It's six weeks. It's short loans, um, and you cycle through them pretty quickly. Um, so it, it was just a very different way of thinking about credit and access to credit. And you know, for me as an immigrant, I have been an 18 year old on my college campus succumbing to the first credit card and not really knowing how to manage credit, how to manage cash flow. And I personally felt that that has been, it's we've been long due in terms of disruption and innovation in access to credit. So I think for me, this dimension of what does the world look like at the intersection of retail commerce payments was really interesting. Um, and with payments, there's also a wide swath of customers that you can actually get access to. So it was a, a, it was a, a full circle moment because when I was at Swell, I had actually incorporated Zip into our um, service okay. there. And my rationale for that at that point is I had inc I had traffic. Traffic wasn't my problem at, at Swell. It was the conversion because you know, the price point or sure. uh, access, you know, the customers that maybe we were not right for. And we did see a lift in conversion at that point. So for me, that as like a marketer, social proof for you. Social proof, this, yeah. you know, here's this payments technology giving me access to customers that I never had access to before. So I think it was a full circle moment where uh, when they reached out, I said, I see something here yeah. and I get an opportunity to build. I get an opportunity to be in a, a growth, you know, environment but still be entrepreneurial and the last reason was the people I fell in love with the people um, you know you spend I spend we all do more time at our jobs than we do with our families I spend more time with my colleagues than I do with my own daughter uh, at least on weekdays so it's important that um, I genuinely like and I'm values aligned with who I work with and I found that at Zip. I joined Zip when I was five months pregnant oh, wow. and the, uh, you know, I'm a woman of color and I was on the precipice of a big life change and I wasn't sure what I was getting into and I think that this, it's testament to the culture that the company has built, the founders have built where in my role as a C-suite executive I was able to be fully myself. What are some things that they did to make you feel comfortable? Um, they were really mad when I came back. Uh, my boss was really mad when I came back after two months and he was, he's like, what are you doing? You know, go like, he, he, he's like, go back. Like, you know, take your, take your full mat leave. I had four months and plus I had three months um, uh, where I could work part time at full time pay, but I think I was just so conditioned in my head as in yeah, you've been doing it for been, yeah. yeah so years. so I think just the support and the validation and the the sense of we will do it the way you want to, Janal. Like you know, so you know I wanted to be um, kept up to date, and I didn't want to just disappear. And just this recognition that um, you know. I, I I was able to take my mat leave and come back the way I wanted to. And I really appreciated that. So yeah. just the support and no judgment, no, you know, no microaggressions. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, there's, not a, there's, there's, there's a lot of companies where that might have not been the case, absolutely. unfortunately. I know, absolutely. And um, so I think that um, I'm really fortunate that I was, my instincts were spot on about the people. Yeah. That's 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 awesome. That's and it really, is an important, yeah. you know, as young people think about, 
your you know their career moves i have been in environments with toxic bosses and yeah. how would you yeah. go about like finding that out in the interview process because i think that's that's hard too i think you have to know yourself i think you have to know your own values and your own beliefs and you have to know the right questions to ask and i still i still you know with every you know, every role change and every time I interview people, I learn about, oh, I should have asked this question sure. if someone just asked me. What's so, your favorite interview question? Uh, more recently, this, uh, you know, my MarTech lead, um, Diana, she asked me as we were closing, she said, Janelle, tell me one thing that you deprioritized. I was like, wow, I said, that's a really that's good, a good question. question. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, come. So I'm going to ask, ask you yeah. right now, what's something that you deprioritized? At, in, life, in life, at work? In life. Fitness right now, unfortunately, um, but it's worth it. It's I have room for three things right now, and it's work, family, family. and uh, my um, yeah, it's work, family, and friends. So. Yeah, that's great though. That, I mean, that's a purposeful. Deep and that's okay position. for now, yeah. you know. At some, you know, Absolutely. my my daughter needs me, and this is she's almost two, and this is I'm, I'm I fall more in love with her every day. And um, what's something that yeah. like just motherhood has taught you? In, in general in life? That it is so fun. Motherhood is fun, and this is not something people talk about often. Um, yes, it is everything that's uh, you know, part of the conversation. It's hard, it's, uh, it's all of that, but it is so fun. Um, the, the sense of wonder that as adults we forget. Um, I get to vicariously experience that through my daughter, and my sense of optimism, my sense of what's important, um, you know, all of that has heightened. That's so, so amazing. Yeah. I think that's a great place to, to, <laughs> to wrap up. I mean, it sounds like you're an awesome, awesome mother as well as a marketer and balancing all these things and just being able to, I loved you talking about diving in to startup environments uh, and proving it to yourself. So I think that's a great place to enter our quick question round, and then we'll wrap up. Wonderful. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so before we start the quick question round, we got to crack open one of these, see what we get, and see if uh, it relates to our, uh, our conversation we just had. Shout out Open Fortune for uh, making this possible. All right. That's a nice touch. Okay. What? Mine's, I'll go first since you're opening it. Mine says, comfort and confidence look good on you. Huh. That's a good one. That's good. That's a good. Aff that's awesome. a good affirmation. Yeah. Oh, mine is uh, beautiful. The joy of giving is its own gift. There you go. And you <laughs> just gave us your time, and uh, I hope it was a gift to you it's as well. Back, right? Mine's it's, airy. Mine is airy are, as well. Are both are airy. I do believe yeah. in the gift of do, generosity. So. Do you have a fortune cookie moment that you think of or associate fortune cookies with? I do. My college years um, and. Uh, uh, it's, uh, I think, one of my early dates with my now husband. Uh, we we bust open um, a fortune cookie, and I remember smiling to myself because it was, I, I don't remember what was in it, but I think it, it gave me an inclination that, oh, this might be something that will last. <laughs> there you go. And it, it's true? Yeah. There we go. Now we're here. We've been yeah. together since 2000 and, oh, goodness, three, four. There you go. Congrats. <laughs> well, I'm glad the ethos of the cookie worked out. Uh, all right, here we go. Person you'd most want to sit down to dinner with, dead or alive? J.K. Dowling. What's your favorite book? One through one through seven. Mm, uh, Goblet of Fire. Goblet of Fire. I like the tournament. Uh, favorite city in the world? Rome. Is it okay to sleep with socks on? Yes, absolutely. Wow. You hear that? Yeah, I heard it. Four for four. It's unreal. I can't believe it. We have a bet going on, and uh, I, I said it's okay to sleep with socks on, especially if it's cold. And the first four guests I had all said no. And then the last four, just come, including you, come from behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought it, I was dead in the water. It's even so now. It's yeah, even it's now. even. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought I was so dead in the water. Uh, favorite romantic comedy? Romantic comedy. Um, I don't watch romantic comedies. Sorry. Oh, okay. Favorite uh, oh, movie? Bridget Jones. Bridget Jones. That's, For the romantic comedy. Favorite movie? Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Uh, best spot to eat in New York? Mala Project. 
Uh, I haven't been there. I really want to. It's dry, a dry hot pot. It's delicious. Favorite Temple U graduate? <laughs> My husband. <laughs> there you go. He counts. No, I don't know if anyone famous. Yeah. In in 40 years, what will people be nostalgic for? Ah, uh, goodness. Um, photographs? One thing people don't understand about marketing is blank. Marketing is um, a business. It's not a cost center. It's a, it's a growth driver. Agreed. Uh, in one sentence, how do you sum up the internet? I'll try giving you a word. Um, wow, this is a tough one. Internet. Oxygen. Oxygen. That's the first one I've heard. I like that one. Uh, what's the worst advice you've ever been given? Uh, I'm oblivious to bad advice. <laughs> there you go. I, yes, no, I don't remember. And last one. In 2033, we, where can we catch you? Hopefully doing more of this and, you know, sharing, um, sh you know, giving back, continuing to give back um, and, and mentoring and um, helping entrepreneurs and companies, uh, you know, scale new heights. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Janelle. Thank you so much for having me.